Well, welcome everyone to our lesson preview uh, for this coming week. It's good to see you all, and especially those uh, watching online. We always appreciate you turning in, and we trust that you uh, uh, gain much from our lesson preview so that you can have a good study this coming Sabbath together. Before we begin, let's say a prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the privilege we have of opening your word once again. Uh, we know that without uh, your word, where would we be? Because we need to know uh, what you would uh, have us do uh, in order to have eternal life. And the word uh, shows us what we need to do. So we, we thank you for this opportunity and we pray that your spirit will guide us as we talk about things eternal today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, the lesson for this uh, coming uh, week, lesson 11, is entitled, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, or Jesus, uh, the, o the finisher of our faith, as the New King James renders it. So, the book of Hebrews, uh, we find the uh, two most beloved chapters the chapter 11 and chapter 12 of Hebrews seems to be the text that we mostly turn to uh, when we read Hebrews. In these two chapters we find the, the Christian life described as a race in which we all participate and in which all who stay faithful will receive a reward. And in these same two chapters, we also see the drama of redemption as a race in which people of faith in the past persevered, they pressed on despite sufferings, despite hardships, uh, but they have not yet received the reward. And why is that? Why have they not received the reward even though they completed the race? way back then. Well, that is because the story ends with us as well, not just them. You see, we, those living today in these last days, we are the final act. The drama culminates with our entering the race. You know, it is like a, a relay race that is run in the Olympics where the baton is handed off to the next runner and then that runner hands it off to the next runner until the last one ends the race. And it's very exciting to watch to see how this race is run and how it is completed. But in this race, in this race, Jesus is seated at the goal line, at the right hand of God, and he provides inspiration as well as the ultimate example of how the race is to be run. He is the ultimate witness that the reward is true and that he is the forerunner who opens the way for us. So now, so now, at the conclusion of Paul's powerful speech concerning uh, Christ's role in our salvation, he now introduces a theme that is a pillar for believers. And that pillar is faith. And his definition of faith is found in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And you know this text very well. Many of you know this text very well. And it simply says now, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Question. What is this one thing that every Christian believer 
throughout this entire planet have in common? What is that one thing? Well, that one thing is hope. But hope in what? Hope in the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the hope. The hope is being able to look into his face and hearing those words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And that is every Christian's hope. And that hope is driven and kept alive by faith. So, now as we begin this lesson, lesson number 11, about faith, and we are talking about a living faith here now, the one who lived and exemplified faith throughout his entire life, the one who died, who was resurrected, and ascended to heaven, and who promised to return to take us home. And we read the text in Acts chapter 1, verse 11. And this is what it says. Remember the scene? Jesus ascending after he was resurrected, while he was talking to his disciples. This is the text. Who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The angel speaking to the men as they watched Jesus rise up from the ground and ascending. This same Jesus, he said, who was taken up from you into heaven will soon come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Jesus, he is coming again, is the good news. He has promised it and he will do it. The thing is, do you and I believe it? Do we believe that he is going to return? Well, if you do, God encourages you to cling to your faith. You have to cling to your faith, friends. If your faith ever falters, review uh, the list of men and women right here. Like we started out saying that our two favorite chapters in, in, in chapter 11 and 12, we read a whole list of men and women who looked to the reward. They were faithful people who now rest waiting to receive the promise with us who are now living in this, on, on this earth. So God made a promise. He made a promise, uh, and He is faithful. When He speaks, when He says to us that He will do this or that, in this case, I will return, I will come again. He is faithful to fulfill that promise to us. So this is not about uh, isolated acts of faith He's asking us to have. Now and then, or when it's convenient, we're talking here about a life of faith, a lifestyle of faith. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 says, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. We're going to go through trials and temptations, just like the runners before us had to endure. But here in Revelation he tells us, do not fear of any of those things which are about to you are about to go through, to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulations ten days. But be faithful until death, and I will give you a crown of life. So that's what it's all about. And so for the next few moments, we're just going to look at a couple, maybe more, three people, just to give us an idea of this faith we're talking about. It's a, it should be a living faith. A lifestyle of faith is what's going to pull us through to the end. And then the reward will come. 
So now, uh, we're going to talk about Abraham and Sarah. Abraham is noted as the father of the faithful. You know, remember Sarah could not bear a child? The evidence was very sound that she could not bear a child. She was old in years. However, she fought logic and she believed that at her age of 80 years old that she can bear a son because she trusted the one who had made the promise to, to her that she will have a son. God made the promise and God never lies. God never lies. So here we have uh, 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 um, uh, 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 husband and wife, faithful servants of the Lord, and and they were way past producing children, and God promised Abraham, Hebrews eleven twelve. God said, "Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead." were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. God is saying that he, don't think that Abram is ready to just kill over and die. At his age, maybe that is true. But with God, nothing is impossible. And God promised him that, that you will have uh, the seed that will come from you will be innumerable as the sand which is by the sea shore. God asked Abram to sacrifice that son that was born. Only one son that was the heir. Well, we know there was another boy, but this was the one that had the promise. And yeah, he, uh, he was, he was. An elderly woman bore this child from a man that was just about dead, as we said here in this verse. Then God asked Abram to sacrifice that child, that one and only child that he had given him. Abram had to stand on his faith, a faith that was based on the promise, on the promises that God had already fulfilled. God said, I want you to sacrifice your child, your son, your son, your only son. By faith, Abraham, here in Hebrews 11, verse 17, God said, uh, By faith, Abraham, the scriptures tell us in Hebrews chapter 11, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who received the promises offered up his only son of whom it was said, In Isaac your, sh your seed shall be called. Concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. What that means is that Abram, when God asked him to offer up his son, and when he was laying on the altar there, and he had the knife in his hand ready to sacrifice his son, he was thinking that maybe God will raise this son up from the dead if I sacrifice it to him. And when the scripture says that he offered up Isaac, many say maybe there's a, there's a translation in correction because he didn't offer up Isaac. I, the angel stayed his hand, remember? Did he offer up Isaac? That's what the text says. Yes, he did. He offered him up in his mind. He had already, he was as good as dead because he was about to plunge the knife into his chest. when the angel said, stop, Abraham. So he offered him up. In his mind, his son was dead, but then he thought that God could even resurrect him. He was willing to, 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 to offer his son and so, uh, and so here, yeah, Abram thought that uh, he's, he's, he's offering up everything, and that's what God expected him to do. 
That's what God expected him to do. His faith prevailed. Believing in God is to believe in the impossible. That's what it is. Believing in God is believing in the impossible. Thanks to him, thanks to God, that the impossible happens. The impossible can happen with God. So, that was Abraham. Now, the other uh, man of faith uh, was Moses. So we can uh, uh, talk about Moses for a little bit. The life of Moses was filled with, uh, with the acts of faith since his birth. Since his birth. So we want to read a few verses here and follow how God uh, used this man. Uh, and, and, and he exercised, he had to exercise faith at every point of his life serving God. So here we read that Moses, by faith Moses, Hebrews 11, 23 says, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. So yet it starts already as a little boy, his parents had the faith to, to know that God is going to keep him and, and, and protect him. So we know the whole story about the bulrushes and the basket, right? So then verse 24 through 26 says this, so, and by faith Moses, when he became of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Then verse 27 through 29. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And by faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he would destroy the firstborn should, should, uh, should touch them. Then verse 29. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so, they were drowned. So Moses lived, lived a life uh, surrounded by constant miracles of faith. So the question is, what can we learn from, from his experience? What can we learn? from the life he led. Well, we, we can certainly learn that, that we, our, our sight must be fixed on Jesus as we live our lives in this world. Our sight must be fixed on him. And without losing sight of the reward, there, there's a reward coming. We talked about the hope. That reward is seeing Jesus. That reward is hearing those words and looking into his face. We, we, the, what we learn from, from his experience is that we may have to bear scorn because of our faith in Jesus. These things happened in the past, but we are living in the 21st century and we are facing a lot of uh, hardships and trials spiritually. And not to talk about physically, in many cases too. But we have to be able to bear the scorn that we get from, from serving God. As we were told last week's lesson, remember, take up our cross and follow Him. What else can we learn? We must not cling to material possessions. Moses had it all. He was really in the palace. He was a prince. He was next to Pharaoh. Wow. Who gets to be there? 
And he gave all that up. He gave all that up so that he can be true to God and be a servant of God. We can expect miracles in our lives as well. God will do it for us, but we must have faith. It all hinges on faith. There's another uh, person in the scriptures that we can look at, and that is Rahab, the faith that Rahab had. And this is so uh, astounding because this was not a Christian lady. This was not a Christian person, right? Joshua, you the story, as you know, that uh, Joshua, he was a devout man who uh, faithfully served God all his life. And on, on the contrary, Rahab didn't have any real notable virtues, right? However, Paul remember, mentioned her when recalling Jericho's uh, conquest and, and, and not, not Joshua, he, he thought of her. You remember how she saved the, the spies that came to her door? She was, this was a prostitute, a non-believer. And so the verse says in 31, 11, 31 of Hebrews, by faith the harlot uh, Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had perceived the spy, when she had received the spies with peace. So, so, so here is Rahab. Uh, Joshua was not given that notable uh, thought at that time, but she was. And we know this lady was mentioned because she appeared in the genealogy of Jesus. And you can question that a harlot, a prostitute, a bad woman, a non-believer? Yes. Why is that so? Why? Why is that that Rahab was, uh, was noted? Because Rahab is an example of the faith that, that all has to have to all those who believe without seeing. She didn't, when those men came in and she hid them, she didn't see a reward. She didn't know what she was going to get. And when she asked them to remember her, let people know when they come to invade that they should not hurt her and her family. She had to just hang on, believe that when the men said yes, that she, 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 she didn't hear the word of God spoken. She believed and she obeyed. And God chose and chose God without uh, hesitation. So yeah, yes, yeah, a, a, a person. And that's good news for you and I. Maybe we're not that bad, we would say. But we, we withhold many times in giving our entire lives to God. But God still will accept us. We could say that the same, uh, the same of all the heroes that Paul did not have the time to mention. Many of them decided to follow God no matter what the consequences would be. They were just keeping their eyes fixed on the reward. So then we come to the, to the last part of the lesson. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. That's what we read, right? Our very first scripture. Why is that so? Well, he is the only one who has reached the end of the race. We're still running. We haven't been given a reward. The people before us, all the centuries before us, have all been running. But nobody has received the reward yet. But he, why is he the author of our faith? Because he's the only one who has reached the end of the race and completed it without question. 
Why is he the author of our, of our faith? Because his perfect life allows us to join the race of faith. Because he lived a good life. When we accept him into our lives, we adopt his life. We get his favor. When Christ is in us, we live his life through us. Also, we can say that he, he is the one who nurtures our faith and he gives it to us. You read Philippians 2.13 says that, that we, he uh, is the one that supports us in our faith-based life. So we have no excuse. We can be victors. Our reward is in reach. We can grasp our reward. We can feel it. We can see it. And then the verse says that no, he's not only the author of our faith, but he is the perfecter or he is the finisher of our faith. And why is that? How do we know? Because he gave up everything for us. He gave everything for us. He gave his very life for us. And another plus is that he never sinned. He never had to ask forgiveness for having done something wrong. No. He just never sinned. He lived that rewarding life in spite of all that he went through. He, there were times when he thought that he, this is it, he's going to cave in. But he kept the faith. Remember, even on the cross. He felt like his father had forsaken him. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was the point of which he could have given up. But he did not do that. He never sinned. Also, his sight was fixed on the joy ahead. Yeah, the joy of the reward of, of him seeing his father again. Of him having us see the father and him again. That was what his sights was fixed on, the joy that was ahead. And then he bore incomprehension and abuse. Look what he went through those last few days uh, on the way to Golgotha and the last four hours. Who wants to go through that? Beaten, spat upon, uh, abused, then finally murdered on the cross. That was him. But if we put our faith in him, that's the big thing. The big thing, the main thing in this lesson for this coming week is when we put our faith in him, by our faith in him, we follow his example. We follow his example. We fix our eyes on him faithfully. Move forward faithfully. And trusting in his promises. That's all we have to go by. That's all we have to go. And sometimes it doesn't look like we're in the right church. We, it looks like we are just treading water as the pastor was preaching this morning. It looks like we are drowning and we just can't make it. Well, we're going to make it because Jesus is our deliverer. He is our savior. He already paid the price. He already saved us. We must just hang on and keep the faith strong. So now, as we finish up, there's a quote I want to leave with you. And it's found in uh, Ellen White's writings and a youth instructor a long time ago. She said, aim to be faithful students in the school of Christ. That's what she said. Learning daily to conform your life to the divine pattern. Set your faces heavenward and press toward the mark for the prize. Remember, you're in a race. You're running, you're running, and you're going to keep faith. He's, she says, set your faces heavenward and press toward the mark of the prize of your high calling in Christ Jesus. And then she says, run the race with patience. Just, just, just run, just run the race. Just run the race. Because in this race, it's, it's not the one who comes first that gets the prize. 
It's the one who finishes the race. And everyone gets a prize who runs the race and finishes it. Everyone gets first place. Draw nigh to God, she says. And if you are desirous of taking the first upward step, you will find his hand stretched out to help you. Wow. How can we fail? Jesus and his father made everything possible for us to succeed and, 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 to, and, to, and to get the reward in the end. But we have to, we have to be faithful. We have to trust and we have to stick to it. If Rahab, the prostitute, could make it, who are we? Who are we to, to not, to, not to inherit heaven? Uh, it, it, can, it can work. It's a no-brainer. But we must be faithful. That is what is being asked for. So this coming week, you're going to have an exciting time discussing some of these points and read up, be ready, and I, I'm sure the Lord is going to bless you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful. Again, that we can have your holy word that teaches us so much about you. There, there are little things that we sometimes just overlook and just pass by. But Lord, you have promised that we are in this race and you'll be with us. You'll run with us. You're the one sitting there at the right hand of God and you uh, uh, have your angels ready along the, the, the sidelines, edging us on, encouraging us, finish, finish, just stay in there, hang in there. What a wonderful God we serve. And we are so grateful that we do serve a God like that. So bless us now as we... Uh, Continue in our way through this new coming week and may we find favor in reading and studying your word is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.